Welcome back. Now let's look at the IS number 16, property plant equipment or the PPNA. So property is what we're referring to as the land and building. The plant is the factory and the equipment is the computer and other equipment that we use in our production processes or perhaps for administrative purposes. Now, for the recognition criteria under the IS number 16, recognition which means we're not we're going to debit the PPE so uh, we're going to recognize the PPE uh, onto the SFP or the statement of financial position is when the property plant equipment is probable that the future inflows will be uh, in the business so for example uh, we're going to be using the PPE to generate future economic benefit uh, by producing a product and to sell it Alternatively, other inflow would be the reduction in costs if I were to use the PPNA. And the expenses can be reliably measured, so which means we're going to spend the money out, we've got the invoice already, so we can recognize that PPNA at that particular value. And of course, very importantly, the PPNA should be held for use, so either for production processes or perhaps for administrative purposes. And in terms of materiality principle in the IFRS, for the small PPNA in practice, so usually the business may set a criteria, any value of the PPNA less than $5,000 will not be uh, capitalized. And it will be different from entities to entities. So in other words, for larger PPNA, we need to capitalize it on the SFP rather than recognizing it into the expense, into the PNO. And for complex asset, so for example, you may have heard of uh, the plane, for example, the aircraft, we've got different elements in there. So that's why we need to depreciate each of the PPE separately. So for example, the engine will be depreciated over, for example, the straight line method over 20 years and table and chairs, we're going to depreciate them over, for example, 30 years, and something like that. And in the IS number 16, if there's anything related to safety and environmental reasons, we're going to spend the money out. So, for example, we're going to plant uh, the, the, uh, the, for example, uh, for environmental reasons, so we need to plant some trees uh, next to our factory. So. Uh, we incur $1 million to build a factory and uh, we incur $0.1 million to building and planting those trees and that $0.1 million also needs to be capitalised as pp and &E because that's for safety and environmental reasons per the laws and regulation in your country. So how about for the initial measurements, so for example, what values are we going to put onto that pp and &E? Again, same as what we've seen in inventories, we need to capitalize it, or we need to recognize it, or measure it at historical cost. So, which means it's the money that you're going to spend in buying that PPE, including the purchase price and non refundable taxes. So, for example, the import duty needs to be capitalized. And also, some of the direct costs. So, for example, the site preparation. So, for example, we're going to get rid of the existing stuff. So, for example, existing facility, we incur $0.2 million there. So, it would be the site preparation costs that needs to be capitalised as part of the pp &E. Transportation costs into delivering the item from the seller's office or the seller's factory into our factory. And that transportation cost, so we can call it as the carriage inwards, needs to be capitalised as well. And also, handling costs, as what we see in the inventories, we to, uh, to uh, get that PPE outside the warehouse or outside our factory to our factory inside. That cost we're going to incur in, for example, renting a special machine uh, to deliver that item. Uh, so that cost needs to be capitalized as well. And also installation costs in making sure that the equipment uh, can be in the current situation or uh, current condition for the business to use, that installation cost needs to be capitalised. 
professional fees, so for example, the lawyers join the contract, the fees that are going to pay to the lawyer, and also other costs related to, for example, for a building, the architecture design costs that needs to be capitalised as well. And also staff costs that we incur in employing specific staff in installing the machine for us and so on, that needs to be capitalised. And also test costs to test the equipment, so you're going to input some materials in there and before it can be finally confirmed that we accept the equipment that we purchased. So the raw material costs that we incur in testing that equipment whether or not it's up to a particular standard that needs to be capitalised as well. But remember, if that material that you're going to input into the equipment and it turned into a final product, the final product, we're going to sell it. So in other words, we're going to net off the net realisable value. So in other words, we input $10 for raw material costs. But after it's been turned into a finished product, we can sell it for $4. So the net amount of $6 that needs to be capitalised. And also any of the dismantling costs, very importantly, if you're building an oil rig uh, or perhaps you are uh, in the mining industry, so you've got a mine in there, and if this is the case then, according to perhaps the laws and regulations in your jurisdiction, you'll have to dismantle it at the end of the 20th year. In other words, the future costs that we need to discount it into today's terms and to recognise the pp &A and to capitalise it. So we debit the pp &A for the future costs, discounting it into today's terms and we credit to increase our provision liability today. Okay, so that's all we can do. And for provision liability, that should be regulated according to the IAS number 37, provisions contingent liabilities, a contingent asset we need to fulfil certain criteria, including the probable cash outflow, present obligation, and also the expenses can be reliably estimated. Uh, and subsequently, for provision liability, we need to recognise the finance costs by debiting the finance costs each and every year, and to credit the increase the present value of the, the provision liability. Okay. So these are what I mean by capital expenditure. So for the capital expenditure, so all we can do is to recognise it as part of the pp e at cost. For revenue expenditure, on the other hand, we simply expense that into the statement of profit or loss in terms of training expenses, admin expenses, for example, the expenses we're going to pay to our staff regarding their salaries and so on. The initial operating losses before we launch the factory before we launch our shop so we may discount our products we may give our products for free and these costs that needs to be expensed rather than being capitalized as pp and &E. and startup costs for example the costs that you obtain the license for you to set up your company instead of uh, buying the pp and &E, that set of costs that needs to be expensed and also the maintenance and repair expenses that needs to be expensed. These are called revenue expenditure. We debit the expense into the PL rather than debiting the PPE at cost. So that's the initial measurement. So for example, the initial measurement is a thousand dollars for a PPE. But how about for a subsequent measurement then? Well, accounting policy. We've got a choice here. Either we're going to choose the cost model, which means we're going to carry $1,000 as the pp and &E costs and to minus the accumulated depreciation. Either we depreciate it using the straight line method or the reducing balance method. Or perhaps we're going to use the revaluation model. In other words, if you purchase uh, the, uh, the, the land and buildings, the valuation may change, and that's why you engage with the independent external valuer to put a value on that according to the market price changes. And therefore, for revaluation model then, so uh, it would be applied to certain items of pp and 
But in the business, it would classify the PPNA into the property category, plant category, and equipment category. For each category, you can use different accounting policy. So for example, for the equipment, in most circumstances, we will use the cost model. Um, for the property, in some circumstances, we may use the revaluation model and something like that. Also for subsequent measurements, for any subsequent major overhaul costs, so overhaul costs, which means the major inspection costs. In certain industries, for example, for the airline industries, the aircraft needs to be subject to inspection for every few years. And these costs will be quite high. And these costs can be capitalized. But in also, some, in, also in some jurisdictions, for example, in China, for example, according to the uh, laws and regulation in China, for a major overhaul costs, it has a definition. So for example, you spend $1,000 to purchase the item of pp and &E. If that overhaul costs does not account for more than 50% of 1000 which means not higher than $500, it will not be meeting with the definition of the major overhaul costs and needs to be expensed because we're going to treat that as simply the inspection expenses. Uh, so it would really depend on which jurisdictions they are in, so to define the major overhaul costs to be capitalised. If you're using the revaluation model, so the revaluation upwards, we're going to put that into reserve, which means the OCI, other comprehensive income, in the statement of profit or loss in OCI, and accumulate that into a reserve, into the SFP. Another element, another area in the ISW 16 is the retirement and derecognition. So retirement, which means we're going to temporarily uh, put the asset into idle condition. We're not using that right now, for example, for a period of six months. But during that six months, we still need to depreciate it. So one of the examples I can give you for the retirement in a practical situation is where the government may have a policy. So for example, in China, uh, the government has a policy in the past to abandon uh, some of the mining companies to operate and therefore the equipment that they are currently using will be put into idle condition and therefore to retire the asset but uh, subsequently the equipment can be used again uh, after this period is gone so in this period still these businesses still need to depreciate these equipment but for the derecognition, on the other hand, which means we're going to sell it, sell the asset will result in the gains and losses from the sale. And the gains and losses put that into the PL. Because when we sell the asset, we simply increase to debit bank and to credit the PP and E uh, at carrying value, which means to credit PP and E at costs, debit accumulated depreciation, and the balancing figure we go into the PL. Or in practical terms, of course, we create the disposal account and the balancing figure in the disposal account will simply be the gains and losses from the disposal. And the previous OCI, if you're using the revaluation model, you've got the previous revaluation reserve. When we derecognize the asset, we're going to transfer that reserve into retained earnings by reducing or debiting the revaluation reserve and to increase and to credit the retained earnings. So to uh, make sure that the previous revaluation reserve uh, would account for the real return for the business if the business has disposed of the item of pp and &E and it will not affect the dividends going to be paid to those shareholders. The disclosure requirements in the ICE number 16, first of all, you need to disclose the accounting policies. For example, either you use the cost model or revaluation model you need to disclose the uh, accounting estimates relating to the depreciation issues, relating to the number of years that the pp &E can be used for, and the residual value uh, or the estimated residual value that the, that the pp and &E has. And also you need to disclose different classes of asset in terms of property category, in terms of the plant category, and in terms of the equipment category. That's very important now.
For depreciation accounting, as I said before, according to item number 16, two major uh, depreciation methods that we can use would be the straight line method and the reducing balance method. And of course, there are some other depreciation methods that's available in different parts of the country that can also be recognised and acceptable from the IS number 16's point of view. How about for residual value then? In depreciating the asset, the business, of course, uh, when buying the asset and subsequently at the end of each reporting period, it will need to estimate that residual value if that residual value is material. So uh, in terms of certain assets, for example, the factory, in terms of the aircraft, in terms of the higher value assets, the residual values should be high. And we can reasonably estimate or assume the residual value is available there. And therefore, you need to update that residual value for, uh, I would say, frequently. So perhaps, perhaps some businesses may review that for every one year, but um, some businesses may review that for every six months and something like that. Uh, it really depends on which uh, jurisdiction and industries that you're working in and the companies that you're working for, and that's different uh, from companies to companies. So, that's all we have. Now, next accounting standards, IAS number 19, Employees Benefit. So, employee benefit, what do I mean by that? Is the expense that we're going to pay to the employee, we simply debit expense and to credit bank. If we haven't paid for that, we credit the accrued expense. And in the exam in particular, we are very interested in the pension plan. So which means when the staff gets retired, it's the money we're going to pay to that staff. So the pension plan can be divided into the defined contribution or the defined benefit. So the difference between these two would be this. So here's the company and here is their staff. And the company would say to the staff, when you retire, you will get $5 million. So the $5 million benefit will be defined or fixed or promised by the company. If this is the case, case then, that's the second type of the pension plan, which means the DB scheme. The DB scheme is the defined benefit scheme. So usually in practice, the company will not manage that pension asset portfolio by itself but the company will engage with an external trust company and to put this money into a trust company and signing a contract with the trust company and the trust company would use this money to invest in buying shares, buying bonds uh, in, in different ways and to grow that asset up so hopefully it will have return to pay to its staff uh, when staff are retired. But therefore, as you can see here, because the companies promised their staff to get this $5 million and therefore the company should recognise the pension asset as well as the liability in the financial statement even though the money has been transferred to a trust company. And for a pension asset, it will recognise the interest income each and every year for a pension liability, it will recognise the interest expense because all we are saying here is we are using the uh, current market terms or we can call it the present value terms. And therefore, according to the amortised cost model, we would have the additional interest expense as well as the additional interest incomes to be recognised in the p and by the company. And additional service costs if the staff are retired the service cost that needs to be incurred and also service cost can form part of the approvals concept to match the benefit they're using the staff to generate future economic benefits with the cost that they incur. Okay, so it's the according to the matching principle. So what the company should do then is to calculate the value of the patient assets was the liability. And the trust company will also calculate the value 
of the pension loss as well as the pension liability. The difference between these two would go into the OCI, or you can call it the reserve in the SFP. Uh, we call it as the remeasurement component, okay, or in the past we call it as the actuarial gains losses. So what do I mean by actuarial gains losses is that because the company in the DB scheme that we promise staff that the staff will get certain amounts of money when they retire. And this is why we transfer the money into the trust company, but at the same time, we also need to employ an actuary to make sure that the value is calculated. So the actuary will calculate the asset value and the liability value from the trust company's perspective. And therefore, it becomes the actual pension asset as well as the pension liability amount in our company's statement of financial position. But if the company does not promise the staff uh, when you retire how much money do you will get, if the company doesn't promise that, it will fall into the defined contribution category or the defined contribution plan. So all we can do when we transfer the money into a trust, uh, in, into a trust company, we simply recognise the expense uh, and to credit the accrued expense liability in each and every year. And that's how we do it. Okay. Now, another accounting standard is the IS number 20, Government Grant and Disclosure of Government Assistance. So what do I mean by Government Grant is where the government give you something, so usually in the form of cash. So there are two types of grants here. So the grant which means help from the government. The government may help you out with regards to your capital because you buy or you acquired a piece of non current asset, for example, PEP&E. And therefore, the government gives you cash to help you with that. Alternatively, you've incurred a certain expenditure. So, for example, the marketing expenditure, salary costs and so on, and the government decides to help you out by giving you cash for reimbursement, and this is called the revenue grant. So in practice, all we could do is we obtain, so for example, $1 million or $100 from the government, for example, and we need to separate that into the capital and revenue grant element. So for example, $70 would be related to capital and $30 related to revenue. That's the first step that we usually do in practice. Second, if a government decides to give you some certificate, certificate itself does not have material value. So in other words, these are non-monetary grant. So give you certain, for example, the green certificate, you can resell those green certificates to third parties to gain profit. If this is the case then, according to ICE number 20, you've got two choices here. It's your accounting policy. You can either recognise those certificates that were received from the government at notional amount, usually $1, or at fair value. So in other words, you're going to benchmark according to the market prices of those green certificate of how much money or net proceeds that you can get and can recognise those certificates as your uh, fair value and bringing that to your inventory in your SFP. So, with regards to grants, the first type is the capital grant, which means you acquire, for example, the building and government give you some money. So under the IS number 20, we've got two methods here. We've got the deduction method, we've got the deferred income method. Under the deduction method, so for example, you acquired a piece of equipment at $200 but government helps you by giving $10. Because that $10 is related to the piece of equipment they bought. That piece of equipment is an example of non-current asset. That $10 would be the capital grant. So when you receive that capital grant of $10, 
you simply to debit bank of ten dollar because because you receive the money from the government and to reduce the PP and the costs by ten dollars. So why this would be a case is because that we spend two hundred dollars out, but the net spend would be a hundred and ninety because we spend two hundred dollars, but we get reimbursement of ten from the government, and therefore the net cost to my business is just to be a hundred and ninety, because when we acquire the uh, equipment at two hundred dollars, we debit PP and the cost by two hundred dollars and credit bank by two hundred dollars. So by using the first method, by netting the PP and the costs against that two hundred, subsequently we will have less depreciation expenses in each and every year. The second method is the deferred income method. So all we can do. Is with debit bank of ten dollars of the capital grounds, and we put that into deferred income liability. Okay, so that's all we can do. And subsequently, we're going to release that deferred income liability into the actual income into the PNL to increase our profit up uh, according to the life of the asset. So, for example, uh, if we bought that piece of equipment at two hundred dollars with debit. PP&E at cost of two hundred, and we credit bank of two hundred, and subsequently, if we were to depreciate that, over ten years, we will debit depreciation expense. By taking that PP and the cost two hundred, divided into ten years, that will be twenty dollars. And to credit accumulated depreciation, we can call it as the PP and the current value of two hundred twenty dollars. When receiving that ten dollars, we debit bank of ten. We put that into a deferred income liability. Into a statement of financial position by ten, but subsequently we'll release that deferred income liability over the next ten years in each and every year by releasing one dollar into the PNL. So by debiting to reduce the deferred income liability by ten divided into ten years, one dollar, and to credit the income into the PNL by one dollar. So to match the expense that we incur when we acquire the asset subsequently, according to the matching principle. So this way is the deferred income method. But for a second type of grant, which means the revenue grant, so all we can do because we receive the money from the government to help you to reimburse some of the expenditures that you incur in terms of marketing R and D and in terms of the. Uh, salary costs, so we will receive money from the government with debit bank, and simply to credit the income directly if there's no conditions there. So, for example, I can give you ten dollars, no conditions set by the government. But if there are any conditions set by the government, so for example, I will give you ten dollar. Yes, I've given you ten dollars already, but you will need to repay me that ten dollar. If you don't fulfil this criteria, for example, I will give you ten dollar, or I've given you ten dollar, and if the ten dollar be finally be belongs to you, if the,、uh, for example, satisfaction rates in your business and the、uh, level of employment targets can be met, okay, and the number of staff that you can recruit, it, and that that ten dollar would. Finally, belong to you. And if there are any deferred income liability for subsequent measurements, all we can do is doing the same thing to debit the deferred income liability. So, for example, according to the number of years, according to the condition, and to credit the income. Or when you finally meet that particular target, you can release that to income into the PNL. How about for repayment? So it means you don't fulfil 
the uh, conditions set by the government and you need to replace the money back. And for the revenue grounds, it's simply remove the additional or the remaining deferred income liability at the credit bank to repay that money and for the balancing figure we put that into the PL as a loss in other words. Because it's just to be we need to repay ten dollar and we recognize that four dollar already but uh, the deferred income or the additional income stake I can recognize in the future will be six but Total six, but I need to pay ten, so I suffer four dollars of losses. In other words, the previous income, so I can recognise, I have already recognised, will not be the income any longer. For a capital grant, on the other hand, it's just to be the same to reduce the deferred income liability and to reduce the bank and the balancing figure. We put that into the PNO. And finally, for the government assistance, so the government may give you some assistance, so for example the media coverage or appointing the staff, uh, assigning the staff from government to your, to your office and to assist you doing some job relating to marketing, related to R&D and so on. So the government does not directly give you cash. Uh, if this is the case then, that form falls into the category of government assistance. For the government assistance, you need to disclose it. No journal entries are required, but you need to disclose that. You need to disclose that fact uh, in the financial statement in your annual report, and that's very important there. Okay, I'm going to stop here for the item number 20, and I look forward to seeing you to cover the next accounting standard in the next of our section then. Bye. APC, accounting for your future.